thank you so much for tuning in to the Psychology Is podcast. I'm Nick. I'm here today with Dr. Corey Clark. How are you today? I'm great. How are you? I'm great too. Nice. Let's see what we end up talking about. But the general theme, <laughs> the general theme is essentially the psychology in politics and in, you know, various groups, intra group psychology, inter group psychology, and psychology related to morality. I know you, you describe yourself as a moral and political psychologist. Mm -hmm. And I'll just say for people who may not know you yet, that you've been, you know, you graduated with your PhD in 2014. You've been a productive, influential scholar ever since then. I feel influential. Like right out, right? <laughs> influential. <laughs> a little <laughs> influential. Been, I suppose there's a very big continuum of how influential people can That's be. That's true. There's a very but big continuum. I think you're in. I'm somewhere on the continuum. <laughs> um you had an appointment at Durham University as an assistant professor. You've moved on to the University of Pennsylvania as a visiting scholar and director of the Adversarial Collaboration Research Project. Mm -hmm. And I'm really interested in exactly what that means. What is, what is the Adversarial Collaboration Project about? Yeah, so essentially what we're trying to do is normalize adversarial collaborations in the social sciences. So adversarial collaborations are when two scholars who disagree with each other, who are known to disagree with each other, who've been publishing against each other for years or decades. X is true. No, X is not true. Y is true. Um, to get them to work together to resolve their scientific differences. So one thing that happens in uh, the social sciences, like a scholar will write a paper and then another scholar comes back and says, no, this is why you're wrong. And then they come back and say, no, this is why you're wrong. And people don't ever move together. Mm -hmm. um, and we think this is probably a big contributor to the replication crisis. So the replication crisis is just that a lot of the social scientific research is um, am I allowed to curse on here? You are. You are <laughs> allowed. Bullshit. <laughs> a lot of it is bullshit. Um, and uh, so the findings don't replicate. And when they're applied to real world context, they don't do anything in the real world. Um, and the open science movement uh, has found that a lot of this is because people are sort of rigging their analyses. They're not um, they're collecting tons of IVs and DVs and studies and only reporting the pieces um, and the analyses that support their conclusion. But the other side of this is the methodological side, where scholars are free to choose any materials they want to choose to test their hypothesis. Um, so they're sort of rigging their methods in order to confirm their hypotheses. And adversarial collaborations don't let you do that <laughs> because another scholar who disagrees with you has to approve the methods as well. Um, and you have to make these judgments. Well, with these exact methods, I predict X will happen and the other one predicts Y will happen. And so we can literally just test these directly. Uh, and we're hoping that this will sort of clarify a lot of these debates show which which side is closer to the truth if either side or are there you know important caveats one scholar's right in this context the other in this context and really try to move science forward and correct a lot of the false positives that are floating around in the social sciences um so we have about five adversarial collaborations going on so far and really we just want to show people that this is possible and that people can do it and it's not terrible <laughs> and hopefully it will result in some really really the highest quality science that mm. that people can do that so is, wish me wish me luck <laughs> i will and I'll, I'll follow along as it unfolds because i think that's great work and i've i remember having this kind of realization and this realization was that sometimes in the peer review process for publication the peers reviewing the paper are very much aligned with the author's thinking. And, mm -hmm. and that to me, it kind of undermined the credibility of the peer review process a little bit. Now, granted, in my experience working with uh, paper reviewers, they are highly skilled and are pretty good at becoming aware of their bias and bracketing, bracketing it to some degree. But still, I think it, some bias sneaks in you know, so yeah. adversarial collaboration in this really intentional way where you're actually seeking it. I think that's great. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really hopeful that the peer review process is interesting in 
there's like two sides of it. So one thing is people can request their reviewers, which I get it's for like the sake of the editor who doesn't want to have to go and Google and find who all the experts are. So it helps the editor. Um, but if they really do, if, people are selecting their reviewers. Of course, they're selecting people that they think are going to agree with the science and who aren't going to challenge it. So that kind of sort of stacks the deck in favor of the author. But then on the other side, a lot of editors purposely seek out somebody who disagrees. And then that person's motivated to think the science is worse than it really is. Um, I don't know that there's a better solution to it, to the peer review process, but I'm hopeful with these. You know, a lot of the time what you get with these disagreements is the two scholars are just mischaracterizing each other's arguments and they say you would predict X, but they wouldn't actually predict X. Mm -hmm. um, and this really forces scholars to articulate their, and this has been something that's really interesting in the projects we have going on already, is before we even design the study, we're realizing that the disagreements aren't as large as they seem to be. <laughs> they actually mm -hmm. agree a lot more than they think um, because they've never been forced to sit in a room together and articulate each other's perspectives back to one another mm -hmm. and say, let's all get on the exact same page. I wanna be able to say what you believe so well that you would have said it that way yes, and vice versa. Like let's yes. really, really understand each other. And there's almost never an incentive for that in mm. science. Mm. In fact, there's an incentive for the opposite <laughs> of that. So, so we're trying to, we really want this to become a norm and have like, if you're a scholar who disagrees with another scholar, the obvious next thing to do is to work together and not just keep fighting for decades on end. So that's we'll exactly <laughs> where I think scientific endeavor needs to go. So that, that's awesome that you're pioneering this and it's to be probably... fair, this was Daniel Kahneman's idea, not mine. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Give credit where credit's due. <laughs> yeah. Um... It was a Nobel Prize winner's idea, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's one of the most frustrating things to listen to people debate or read a back and forth um, between two people who clearly don't understand each other mm -hmm. and who clearly don't fully understand each other's positions. Uh, because as the saying goes, they just end up talking past each other. They don't address the core points. They don't actually mount a logical counter argument. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's just futile ultimately. And unfortunately, in, in my assessment, I feel like many political debates are of this very low quality. And I, every time I've seen debates where, you know, the, the host will make sure like, I watched a debate between Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson, which got really popular mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. And I'm trying to remember the guy who, there was different hosts, but I think it was one of the Weinstein brothers. Okay. And I think it was Brett Weinstein. And he he had each of them articulate the other other person's position in a steel man way, as, as clearly and accurately as possible. And then he had them each articulate what they think the other person mm -hmm. thinks their own argument is took mm -hmm. it even one more step, not just articulate their argument, but articulate what they would say my argument is, and then giving them the opportunity to correct that in any way. So anytime I see that, it's just, it feels like ex the right spirit of debate. It's honest. Yeah, that's a nice next step too. Yeah. Mm. What do you what do, what do I think? What do I think you think? And what do I think you think I think? Exactly. <laughs> and then exactly. let's get on the same page on all of those Precisely. before we move forward. <laughs> Precisely. Yeah. Well, let me set up, let, let me set the stage a little bit for my first question to you, if I may. Mm -hmm. So this is what I would say. If I know your position on one political issue, I would be willing to start placing bets on your positions on several other political issues. So if I know you are pro-life, I'll put a big bet down that you defend the second amendment and I'd bet you're against raising taxes, you're for firm immigration laws, you think racial sensitivity training does more harm than good, the first amendment is sacred, defunding the police is a disastrous idea, a strong military <laughs> is our backbone, you probably don't have your pronouns in your bio, and photo ID <laughs> should definitely be required for voting. On the other hand, 
if I know you're pro-choice, I bet your stance that is that guns do more harm than good. You're for heavily taxing the wealthy and think immigration improves the country. The First Amendment is sacred, but there is some language we can mandate be said or not said. Racial sensitivity training can be done right and should be done. Defunding the police is a good idea. The military indu industrial complex is our great shame. You're likely to have your pronouns in your bio and your and photo ID requirements is a form of voter suppression. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I don't wanna stereotype people or create caricatures. And I love and shout out to the people who think in the gray, who, who think in a nuanced way and who are not extreme. Um, but I do think that there are many people who really do hit on each of those points I just mentioned. And, and to me, my question, I'll state it and then I'll just say one more thing and give you the mic. My question is how much of this conformity and uniformity of political thought can be explained by in-group bias and how much can be explained by differing value systems between political groups. Mm -hmm. So I won't say anything. Well, obviously all those positions completely logically cohere. And if you're pro-choice, then you have to be for low taxes. This is the only thing that makes sense. <laughs> How can we <laughs> Or sorry, high taxes. I got right, that right, confused. Right, right. <laughs> um, yeah, those are good. Although I don't know if most people, if most people are pro-choice would have their pronouns. That still seems sort of rare to me, Fair. but maybe not. Fair. I don't know. I guess it's a higher um, likelihood, but you're right. Definitely, you're right. definitely way more likely. Um, yeah, so it's hard to put an exact percentage on it, but I would say the portion that is sort of part, I would partially call it sort of in-group conformity, but it's a much more complicated process than that, but that that is a substantial portion of it. And that other than religious differences between conservatives and liberals, which there are fairly large, conservatives are much more likely to be religious and religion's a huge part of their lives. And that affects a lot of political judgments and things related to politics. But um, other than that, I think values are really not that dissimilar between liberals and conservatives. And there's a lot of similarity between the two groups and a lot of differences within the two groups. That makes me fairly skeptical of a lot of the arguments that that like conservatives and liberals are sort of fundamentally psychologically different. I think there are small differences between them. And those could accumulate in a variety of ways that could compel a liberal. But here's here's one way I think about it. And this might not be the best way, but I, I find it to be useful. You know, people aren't, there aren't two kinds of people. There are millions of kinds of people. And let's pretend they could exist on a spectrum from like red to purple. We'll put them on like a color spectrum. Mm -hmm. And then maybe you're like, maybe you're like green. <laughs> Well, you have to choose between red and purple. So like, which side do you go? Well, you're maybe a little bit closer to purple. So over time you become, you, you only choose when you choose, so you choose purple. And then over time you become more and more purple even though you started off green, right? Um, and so this happens when we identify with a group, when we come to see ourselves as a member of a group. We start to like that group more. We treat the people in that group better. In turn, they treat us better. We want to believe what they believe. And we work, we don't really work hard because this comes naturally, but we sort of situate our whole world so that we are surrounded by people who share those same views, that we're exposed to information that will allow us, allow us to have the right beliefs. Um, I think an even better example of this is if you look at different religions, like it's not that people who come to believe one religion versus a different, a different religion are so different from one another. It's just that once you're part of a community, believing the right religion is really important. It helps you make friends. It helps you find a romantic partner, perhaps maybe a little bit less in the U S than in some other countries, but historically, um, you, whatever the local group that you belong to believed, it was really essential for you to believe what they believe. So we have all of these psychological mechanisms that allow us to conform all of our beliefs and preferences and opinions to whatever the group believes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's extremely powerful. And it's, 
I think a lot of people uh, appreciate that, that reality, but there's still a lot of resistance to the idea. And people want to think that liberals and conservatives are just these like fundamentally different beasts, but I don't see good evidence for it. And, um, and I think the differences between the groups are so small that, and as you pointed out in your question, there's really no logically coherent philosophy underlying the set of beliefs that a Democrat would believe or the set that a Republican would believe. Um, so it has to be something more than that. And I think it, it's really about how we, we evolved to, to recruit information and think about information in a way that allows us to adopt the views of our local groups, the groups that we identify with. So mm. I can't put a percentage on it, right. but I would say substantial a substantial yeah. percentage of it between 10 and 90 <laughs> percent <laughs> yes yeah well yeah you spoke to that very intelligently and when you talk about the evolutionary basis of this and how historically it's always been adaptive of course to conform to your local groups set of values and standards and beliefs and culture so and you've described tribalism as an ineradicable feature of human cognition and so given given this how should we proceed and how can we minimize conflict between tribes yeah it's an excellent question um I get asked that a lot and I <laughs> I never have a good answer maybe one day I'll have a good answer um there are a few suggestions that I think are sort of, I'm going to, I think I'll write an article about this one day. I'm going to call it impractical solutions to political polarization. These are all the theoretical ideas that could lead to depolarization, mm -hmm. but that will never happen. Um, so like one is having a sort of superordinate identity. So if people in the U.S. could identify as people from the United States, um, but that's become politicized because now conservatives are like patriotic and liberals are like, we hate America. Um, and then we have, you can have a common enemy, which obviously nobody wants. We don't want to have a common enemy. <laughs> and also COVID could have been an opportunity to have a common enemy, but that became politicized. Whereas liberals were like, wear your mask and conservatives are like, don't tell me what to do. Um, so that might not ever work. Um, I, my idea which we need more empirical support for, but I, I, I guess I'm kind of looking at this a little bit in some, in some work, but my idea is to sort of sh change what people seek acceptance and status for uh, away from sort of signaling their political identities toward and I, I care about this for scientists, but maybe it could work for everyday people too, toward like humility and truth seeking and openness and kind of make that be like the cool thing that people attach their identity to. And you can become part of that group and make that be your group identity and make that be the thing that you care about. Um, and I don't know if that's fully possible in politics. It, it might not be, but I would like to see it among scientists because a lot of scientists, you know, they're on Twitter and they're just basically political actors, <laughs> you know, they like engage with politicians and like different political narratives and they care about policy and they want to like create change. And maybe there's a place for that in science, but I wish most scientists didn't have that as something that they were trying to seek attention for and trying to seek um, reinforcement for, because I think that turns them into political actors and it interferes with their ability to be a good scientist. Um, so I really wanna make this uncertainty and the humility thing to be like the cool thing and make people <laughs> wanna identify with that. Um, it just puzzles me to no end how, how certain people can be in their political views given how complicated all of the most complicated political issues are. Nobody has the right answer. If they did, we wouldn't be fighting about it anymore. And so we really should, like, I can believe, I have, you know, various political beliefs, but they would never make me hate another person because 
I have a lot of uncertainty and I'm balancing trade-offs with complicated issues. I understand other people are doing the same thing. Um, and I wish everyone could have that attitude toward their political opponents. And then that would be like a nice first step is just let's not agree, but let's agree that it's complicated enough that we don't have to hate each other. Nice. We can just be like, it's really hard. Right. <laughs> um, now, will that ever happen? Probably not. So mm. all of this, these are my impractical, my impractical solutions. Um, They're good. I mean, and I, the first one you said, the supraordinate identity, that one is, is really intriguing for me. And especially because I can see, and for some reason, my mind always relates it to sports. When I've played sports or watched sports, you can see how, like, for example, with the football team, within the football team, you have different subgroups you have mm -hmm. like the offense and the defense and at practice like we go at each other and we it's like serious serious um hostility between the two <laughs> groups but then of course when it comes time for a scrimmage or a game we are one unit we're a team but then you can see how like um in in college football you have like the sec and the different the different conferences and there's a shared identity there and then there's just NCAA athletes and there's a shared identity there and then there's just athletes and there's a shared identity there and so you can see how it how it does scale up it does matter though of course what actually feels meaningful for someone and it seems that the farther you scale that up and the larger the group gets the mm -hmm. less personally meaningful it becomes for the individual mm -hmm. but I don't know maybe there's a way that it could become more meaningful, even if you're identifying with a larger group. Granted, that's evolutionarily unprecedented. So we don't mm -hmm. really know how the psychology, psychology of that would work. And yeah. then also just to comment on the, the common enemy idea, I've honestly thought about how if, if aliens showed up and wanted to go to war mm -hmm. with us, you would see the greatest unity among humanity ever. We would yeah. finally feel like one species yeah. But we don't have that. So we fight amongst each other, kind of like the offense and the defense did at football practice. I'll add that to my list of impractical <laughs> solutions. Find the aliens and have them attack us. But yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right. Like it it does seem to be harder as you grow in size. And it is it is possible. Or even if we had another species that was competing with us, which we don't, you know, mm -hmm. humans basically do what they want with other animals. Um, but if humans had an enemy like that, then they would, you know, countries that don't get along would be forced to get along because they care more about preserving humans than they do, you know, their little bickering matches between them. Right. Um, I, yeah, I mean, one idea that I don't, again, another impractical thing is just like, if people cared more about their local communities, you know, your neighborhood, for some people, people's neighborhoods are completely politically homogenous, but for a lot of people, their neighborhoods are a little bit politically diverse. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone in the neighborhood cares about that being a nice, safe, you know, pleasant, pretty neighborhood. They don't want trash around. Um, they don't want like just risks of like burglaries and things like that. So if you could get people to care about their local communities more and less about the national political divides, the national politics, um, that would, that would potentially be helpful. But, you know, now that we're all online and we're global <laughs> and like people's, the top hundred people I interact with, none of, one of them, the person that I live with, lives within a hundred miles of me and the other 99 live all over the globe. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not, you know, it'd be like going backwards. Yeah. Uh, and I, I doubt that would happen. Uh, although the pandemic, you know, it's kind of forced people to hunker down a little bit, but yeah, that's, that's so far as I can tell that did not help. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. And just this, you know, you also talk about selective exposure and when it comes to how are some of our views so persistent mm -hmm. when there's so many different perspectives in the world and it, it seems and I think you've argued that part of that is selective exposure and in a sense like being in echo chambers being surrounded by people who totally agree with you and there's this very good feeling that comes 
from agreeing with somebody, there's this alliance that forms. Mm -hmm. So what, what filters, like what filters are in place as mm -hmm. you see it that allow for this selective exposure? Mm -hmm. Honestly, now it's, it's everything. It's everything. So selective exposure, I, I, I kind of talk about political bias in two levels. One is approaching and avoiding information. And then one is how you respond to information once you get it. Okay. So selective exposure is happening on the approaching, avoiding side of things. Um, and what you see is basically people approach information that confirms their beliefs and avoid information that challenges their beliefs. Um, but it's happening on every single level. So it happens in our where we choose to live. So there's more and more evidence that people are migrating to politically homogenous communities. Um, communities used to be a little bit more mixed and over time they just get more and more and more and more homogenous and we get bubbles, you know, Trump country, Biden country. Um, then, so, so it happens in where people are living. Consequently also it happens in who we select as friends it happens in who we select as friends in our real world, who we choose to date and marry, who we choose to be friends with on Facebook, who we follow on Twitter and probably Instagram and all the other ones. Um, and then, so it's happening co completely in all of our social environments. And then it's happening in all of our informational environments as well. What news we listen to, what kind of political figures we follow on social media. And it's a it's a feedback loop that just makes things worse and worse over time because what happens is I make my, all of my, all the people I follow on Twitter are liberal. So everything that I retweet is liberal. So I get more liberals following me and liking my stuff. And the more, the better liberal I am, the more positive feedback I get. Anytime I say something they don't like, I get no positive feedback because the only people following me are liberal. So I'm told be more this way. And it just builds and builds and builds over time. Um, and hence you get the polarization. People get pushed into these separate groups and they become more extreme. And as they become more extreme, they are incentivized to continue to become more extreme. There are these findings called, um, this effect called acrophily, uh, attraction to the extremes. And people, people like um, other people who are similar to their own political identity, but more extreme than them. They would rather have somebody who is a really clear, I know what you believe on everything. You are, as you described, if I know your one belief, I know all of your beliefs. You're completely predictable. You're not going to change your mind. I can depend on you to be a good Democrat or a good Republican. Um, whereas a lot of people are more moderate, but they don't like each other because they're unpredictable and they, you know, you can't put them in a box. And so that doesn't make us feel as good. And so these people get rewarded. These people get the followers. These people are the ones driving the conversation. They're getting all the attention. Um, and so it's really, it's happening on every level of our social and informational worlds and once the cycle starts it's just like it just it just continues to reinforce itself and get stronger and stronger and like and it, it all the incentives line up you know what does twitter care about they want clicks and retweets and activity they want engagement what do you advertisers care what do, what do news what does the new york times want they want people clicking and sharing and reading and you know everybody is reinforcing each other yes. in the exact same way. We're all contributing to each other, becoming polarized and to ourselves mm. all the time. <laughs> right. right. It's not like I'm, I'm making it sound like really catastrophic. But <laughs> maybe it is a little bit. Um, <laughs> but I think the, that momentum that builds. Yes. Yes. Is, is real. And, and it's kind of like you, you kind of just explained what you were saying earlier with the metaphor of being a color green mm -hmm. is a little bit closer to purple. And then as you kind of side with purple, you become more purple. I think mm -hmm. you just explained that, that, that the mechanisms of that process. Um, yeah, gosh, how interesting. What was the name of the effect again, where you're attracted to extreme? Acrophily, love Acrophily. of extremes, I think is like mm. the Latin or whatever interpreter <laughs> translation, I don't know. Okay. 
fascinating. So the acrophily <laughs> effect, fascinating. Yeah. So there's something called homophily, which is attraction to simi similarity. Mm -hmm. And that happens too. People are attracted to similar others, but they would, they're more attracted to similar and extreme others rather than like a similar and more moderate others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just, just keep going that way over yeah. time. Yeah. And so one thing I think about too is when we do, so when we do get exposed to differing views, um, I suppose that can come in, in multiple forms. It can come in the form of evidence of mm -hmm. the contrary, and it can come in the form of just kind of a take or an argument or an, someone articulating their differing perspective. And I think with either one of those, something can happen, which I've heard social psychologists call attitude inoculation where you're not getting the full argument or you're not getting the whole study. You're just getting a little dose of it that can be, um, you know, combated. You can, you can either dismiss it or counter it. So, you know, for example, um, someone could say, you know, there's a bunch of people out there who are trying to take our guns away and who are saying that no one should have guns ever. Right. And so it's, <laughs> It's like that that one, I guess, is a little bit more of a of a misrepresentation than just a little piece of it, because sometimes you can have just a little piece of it that actually is accurate, but it's incomplete. And then sometimes you can just have a totally misrepresented form of someone else's argument. Either way, though, it can reinforce my own belief because I see that my I'm able to counter that argument. And so mm -hmm. I feel even more secure now in my existing position. And I also feel like I'm not in an echo chamber. I feel like I'm actually considering opposing perspectives, mm -hmm. but to really consider someone's opposing perspective takes time and cognitive resources. And that's not something we like to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that's true. And there's like, there there's, partly like some almost like strategic reasoning to it. Cause I think what you got a lot of the time is people will, if I'm going to read an article that I hate, uh, I'm likely to, and I'm, let's say I'm the kind of person who like reads stuff I hate and then tweet something about how stupid it is. They pick out the dumbest thing. <laughs> they pick out the worst argument in the whole entire piece to slam and as though if you can find one flaw, that there's nothing valuable at the perspective whatsoever. Mm. Um, and this happens in science as well. Like when people will critique other people's perspectives, they'll like be like, oh, well, this study was so stupid. You know, here's the obvious counter explanation. Like, okay, well, what about the other seven studies? Mm. <laughs> um, and so people, people sort of use that strategically, like picking out the dumbest thing to try to, you know, I say like, they think if you remove a few bricks, you demolish the castle. Um, uh, yeah, so that's something that people can do to kind of dismiss other people's arguments. And then, I, yeah, I guess signal to other people, look, I do engage with other things. I do sometimes read these other <laughs> articles, but yeah, you're not reading them charitably. You're not being open-minded and you're not like looking for what is the best case what is the best case they made in the whole article? What was the best argument? What's the one that I can't respond to intelligently and I can't say why they're wrong? Um, but that's just not what people are designed to do. So they tend not to do that. <laughs> right. Yeah. And there's a term that I often think about outgroup homogeneity bias, mm -hmm. this bias, this belief that people in this outgroup are all more similar to each other than the people in my in-group are similar to each other. They're just, mm -hmm. you know, all of them over there, they're pretty much the same as each other. And it's interesting because as I'm thinking about it right now, given everything you described about the momentum that kind of pulls people and polarizes people, to some degree that suggests that groups do have a tendency to become homogenous. And at the same time, we, I think, assume that a little too much. We, it's, it's very degrading to a whole group to say that they're all the same as each other. You overlook 
individuality. You overlook rich differences within groups. Mm -hmm. And I think that sometimes this is simply the result of a blunted perception that comes from a lack of exposure to people in that group. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I think, a big part of it. But I just, and I, and I wonder what the solution is to that, because it's really what lays the groundwork for stereotyping, I think, because if you're gonna have a stereotype, you first have to believe that everyone is similar enough that this generalized statement about them could apply. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess my, my question for you on this is, what could be a solution to help people get to know out people from the out group better? Yeah, yeah, that's a good, it's a good question. And I, I would actually say it's a little bit, it's a little bit even more than that. You So you have, you're right, the out group um, homogeneity, where people think they're more similar to one another. There's also a similar effect where they view their out group as more extreme than they really are. So they caricature, you know, the, um, there are a bunch of studies like this where they say like what percentage of Republicans make more than $200,000 a year and Democrats way overestimated. Mm. What percentage of Democrats are LGBTQ and Republicans way overestimated. Um, and if you look at their attitudes on various things, they tend to view the their opposing group as much more extreme and much more dissimilar from them. And then they also view them as more evil than they are. So if you ask them, uh, they have these studies with like donating money and like how much money would a Republican donate and Democrats underestimate how much Republicans would and vice versa. So they think the out group is more homogenous, more extreme and more evil <laughs> than they really are. Um, and I think part of this is because of what I was talking about with the extremity. We elevate in the media extremists. We reshare their content. We they're the ones that get all the attention. And so that's what we're exposed to. And if I live in a completely Democrat, like all of my neighbors, all of my family, all of my friends, all of my colleagues are all Democrats. The only Republicans I know are Tucker Carlson, let's say. Like you're not going to have a really good um, understanding of an average, typical Republican in the United States. Um, and so it's because we're being exposed to a very peculiar, non-random subset of our opponents um, that that this perception can actually just seem straight up accurate. It's just what we're exposed to. Um, and the obvious solution to it would be to like meet some normal people <laughs> who disagree with you um, on political issues. Now that might be harder for some people than others because a lot of people do live in these homogenous communities and they also just don't want to meet other people. Um, which is interesting is like, I find, in, you know, academics, they're, they're basically all liberal, but some liberal academics have like relatives who are Republicans <laughs> and some don't. And I find that a lot of the ones that are just like a little bit more sympathetic about some of these issues are often the ones that do have relatives because we know like, oh, I, I love some Republicans. They're not bad people. They disagree with me on things, but their motives are good. Um, so, I mean, I think, I think that would be the obvious solution, but people would have to take it upon themselves. Like no one can force people to interact with people that they don't want to interact with. So if you want to have a better perception of reality, if you want to have a better perception of what, if you're a Democrat, what Republicans are like, or Republican and Democrats, meet some normal people, <laughs> mm. meet your neighbor who's a Republican, mm. um, and also, like, you need to have more than a superficial understanding of them because it could be easy to be like, they have a gun. OK, I know everything I need to know about them. Um, but it's yeah, it's uh, it's obviously really hard for people. So it's the impractical, impractical solution. <laughs> yeah. And when you get to know the average person, you get to con you have the opportunity to connect on an emotional level especially if it's family, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that matters very much because when you are only thinking about the out group as the people 
on TV and who are elevated in social media, you do get these almost caricatures, like you said, of that view. And then you kind of, you, you think you understand people who have that view better than you really do. Mm-hmm. Something I, I've referred to a few times on this podcast with so people listening, my, the, the, my favorite then <laughs> listeners who have listened to multiple episodes will remember <laughs> this, that- Hi guys. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the doc have you seen the documentary by any chance called white right white right no okay i'm happy to put it on your radar it was okay. came out a couple years ago made by a woman dia khan who's a film producer she's a muslim woman and she basically gets to know a bunch of white supremacists oh, for sure. and they're extreme so people who are interested in watching this just know that there is completely uncensored most vile Mm -hmm. hateful speech possible every word you can think of this yell it and she is so courageous it's it's incredible um she interviews these men and women mostly men actually and she goes into their apartments and she gets to know them and they get to know her and one Mm -hmm. thing that the documentary really exposes is that all of their hateful views were based in a complete ignorance of who that type of person that they supposedly hate really is and how much common ground there is between them and this group that they hate. And ultimately, although it's so disturbing really to see how hateful some people can be, ultimately the documentary becomes uplifting because you see that with exposure, especially in the right way, the right context with good intentions, people's hate kind of crumbles it can't mm-hmm. withstand a bunch of positive interactions, sincere <laughs> positive interactions with this yeah. supposedly hated person. Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating. And I could imagine, I mean, you could imagine it going horribly, horribly wrong. Yeah. But for a lot of people, yeah, potentially something like that could completely work. And they just, yeah, they don't have the proper exposure. I mean, I think in the context of politics, like you don't, I, I've, been part of some of these groups where they try to bring like Republicans and Democrats. I mean, th- those go okay because you have like self selection by a very abnormal group of people, the kind of people who want to do that. But I think like probably a lot of the time you wouldn't even want the interaction to be focused around politics. You know, you want it to be where we're, we play basketball together mm-hmm. and I like playing basketball with you right. or we like to cook and so we get together and we cook. And then you care about the person, you care about their life. They're this people are people. They have similar kinds of problems as each other um, and get to know them on like a personal level. And the politics doesn't even have to be part of it. I mean, sometimes like you'll know someone reasonably well and then down the line, you find out their political views and you're like, huh, I had no idea (laughs) And because it didn't matter. A lot of the times it doesn't matter. I think about but that. But then if people start with that piece of information, yeah. it can just blow up the whole thing and make it impossible. Great point. I think about that often. If you, which, which comes first, knowing the person or knowing their political position? And it's like the question of does knowing, so if you know someone really well and then you find out that they are Republican, does that change your view of them? Or does that change your view of what a Republican is? Mm -hmm. And I think that's an interesting question and and applies to a lot of things because we have these really fixed views on and just stereotypes basically about various types of people or even something as simple as like, you know, if you find out that someone smokes weed and Mm -hmm. does that change your view of the person or does that change your view of weed? And I think should, of course, change your view of being Republican or of weed or something like that because getting to know the person I think should be paramount yeah you want to use the individuating information you have rather than stereotypes yes obviously especially when you have the individuating information Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah yeah I mean it would be great if something like that could happen on a large scale but unfortunately I mean it's it's kind of up to to individuals take the initiative to do it and most people would never be motivated to do it and the kinds of people who would be motivated to do it are probably the kinds of people who don't really need to. <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah. Um, so that's the challenge. Um, I guess people could drag, the people who would do it could drag people who wouldn't do it to it. these kinds of things. There you go. There's the solution. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it is worth 
acknowledging that there are certain things I suppose you could find out about the person that should change your view. Like if you get to know yeah. someone and you like have fun playing basketball and talking sports with them, and then you find out that they are a KKK member, that should yeah. change your view of them. Right. You know, whenever the person is in a group or does a thing that is defining of their character, mm -hmm. then I suppose that's different. But anyway, it's still, I think it's a good idea to just, like you said, individuating information to focus on that, to connect on a human level, and then allow your view to change on whatever the group they're part of, because now you're actually getting to know someone in that group. Yeah, especially mm -hmm. if they're the only person you know in that group, then Precisely. it's a good basis. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So the other it, it, something else I wanted to bring up was um, how ambiguity exaggerates mm -hmm. bias. This is something you've talked about. So it, please explain this to us. How does ambiguity exaggerate bias? Yeah, this is this is a really important part of the argument that uh, that often gets overlooked because so there are I think most scholars sort of accept that motivated reasoning happens you know that people are biased and they approach certain kinds of information and they um, are really resistant to information that challenges their beliefs but there's another perspective that some scholars uh, continue to believe is that people are generally motivated to seek accuracy and the way they can reconcile this with all of the findings demonstrating the selective exposure effect and this political bias effect is that if I, let's say I think a really um, hyperbolic example would be, I believe the earth is a sphere. <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure it's a sphere. And so when I see an article that says the earth is flat, I, why would I read it? It's a waste of my time. So you could apply that same logic to any sort of political argument. I'm sure I'm right. So it would be a waste of my time to read an argument that ch challenges it because that's obviously a stupid argument because I'm right. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a really complicated issue. The, 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 the cases where you see, it, the reason it's so complicated is because when information is plainly obvious, when the truth is known and there's no refuting it, like a tree, tree's leaves are green or something, even if people really wanted to believe that they weren't, they couldn't because it would blow their credibility. People would think that they were crazy. And so biases reveal themselves only when there's plausible deniability surrounding the issue. So they only, not only, I shouldn't say only, but mainly reveal themselves in cases where the information is ambiguous. And this would, I think, apply to all kinds of empirically incorrect beliefs. So things like superstitions or supernatural beliefs one reason people can have those beliefs is because it's impossible to prove that they're definitely stupid, right? <laughs> like no one can prove that that ghosts don't exist or nobody can prove that, um, I don't know, what would be a more ridiculous one, Nessie, that Nessie doesn't exist. Now that's a more extreme example, but in, in the context of politics, almost everything is ambiguous. Like if you take any particular political issue where there's disagreement, it's on a really complicated issue that involves like policies that could have a positive effect and a negative effect. And we don't know how big or when they would happen or what all the consequences would be. Um, and so it's easy to maintain, I mean, even take something like climate change where, you know, people generally agree that it's happening. Um, and so it looks like, oh, it's, it's, it's not an ambiguous issue. We know it's happening. Well, people disagree about how, how big of a catastrophe it is. People disagree about what we should do in response to it. And so even though bits of it are sort of clear, bits of it, a lot of it is really unclear. And so having various beliefs about climate change are sort of defensible. Um, and so you really get the politicization of issues and polarization surrounding issues when they're really complicated, when they're really ambiguous, when you don't have other good information um, that can prove you're definitely wrong. And what's fascinating about this to me is that what that means is, is that all of our biggest political disputes that we have, all the things that we hate each other for, are for things where we really don't yet know what the best thing is. <laughs> so 
it's it's precisely for the things where we should have more humility, where we should be more uncertain and we should be more likely to be like, oh, it's possible, you know, we have different perspectives because it's complicated and we're difficult trade-offs. Mm. Um, but instead, what happens is both sides become entrenched, both sides become more sure of themselves, and both sides hate the other side for having these different beliefs. Mm. Um, and so it's just, it, 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 it's basically what you need. It's the piece that you need to really see polarization is this, this ambiguity or this complicated information environment where it's really hard to know what's true that allows people to be biased, that allows them to basically use their group as the, the main input in forming their belief because they don't know. Um, but consequently, that makes them certain that they know uh, and in two completely opposite ways or, or more, depending on how many groups we're talking about. Interesting. This is a tough question and you don't have to answer it or, or it's okay, <laughs> but, and I don't, I don't want to like corner you into saying something controversial, but okay. when you're describing the, um, the situation where something is just like as clear as we know that the earth is spherical, something mm -hmm. is simply a fact in your mind, no more argument needs to happen about it. It strikes me that there are some things that are depicted in that way but have not reached that same level of validity, you know, the same mm -hmm. level as the earth is spherical. And I'm wondering if, if you can, if in your view, what do you think has been depicted as being like case closed, but mm -hmm. it's really not case closed? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I can think of a lot of things in social psychology because um, that's my area. I mean, one of the biggest ones and something I've talked about in some of my papers um, is like the significance of unconscious implicit racial bias and discrimination. And we thought that these unconscious racial biases were leading to discriminatory behavior and it could explain all these differences in outcomes. Um, it became sort of assumed as true and now it's affected policy. I don't know if you've ever had to sit through like an unconscious bias training before, but I have. And it like drives me crazy because I'm like, we don't even know if this is real yet. We we don't even know if it's real in the first place. We don't know if it predicts anything at all. We don't know if it predicts discrimination. And we don't know if changing it does anything. And for all we know, it could do something bad. Um, so there was like premature closure on that. And I think because this was driven by liberal academics who wanted to believe this was true, this was a really like congenial finding for liberal scholars. They just pushed it forward without looking back. There was criticism, but it mostly just got completely ignored. And now it's been maybe millions of dollars, maybe even billions at this point, probably hundreds of millions at least have been invested into this idea Um and the, the, the scholarship is just, at this point, we know like almost nothing about it. Um, so that would maybe be an example from, from my discipline. I would, I would say that there are probably a lot of related things like that. And it, it would differ for like Republicans and conservatives. Like which ones do they think are the issues that are closed? Um, I mean, I'm trying to think like what would be a good example of one for Republicans, people will think I'm biased if I can't think of a good one for Republicans, right? <laughs> um, you know, about it with you. <laughs> are you're helping me come up with one? Trying. I mean, Republicans are wrong. I mean, oh, I mean, one with Republicans. I mean, this isn't exactly the same. Here's actually an interesting study because it points out both sides. Um, neither liberals or conservatives believe in or they're both skeptical, let's say, of evolved gender differences. And conservatives are skeptical because they're skeptical of evolution. And liberals are skeptical because they're skeptical that men and women are different. Um, mm. So they have two different reasons for not believing a particular thing that's it's, it's basically true. There are mm. evolved gender differences. Men and women had different social pressures and they selected for different traits in men and women. Um, but both groups deny it for different reasons. Um, hmm. So yeah, there's a little bit, I mean, and, and even like climate change, you know, uh, a lot of conservatives are excessively skeptical about it. 
um, beyond the degree that would be warranted, I think. So yeah, there's, there's a lot on both sides. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, certainly both sides would like to claim like, there, but it's done. It's done. We're right. We know this is true. And liberals do this especially because they like to claim ownership of science. Um, and there's some truth to that. Like liberals do have more. Well, it's, that's complicated because scientists tend to be liberal. So there's like an in-group bias there as well. Mm. Um, but they're sort of more accepting of science in general. But by claiming it as their own, they only would push conservatives away so if you're a person who really cares about like science as the best chance we have for uncovering truth then you really should want it to be for everybody and you shouldn't try to claim it as like a political move and be like not for you guys you're all out yeah um so i think that's a sort of unfortunate an unfortunate um issue happening Mm. That's, that's, it's interesting to think about this. I've observed it, that it almost seems like for some people, science is becoming part of their identity or, or becoming mm-hmm. an advocate for science is, beca- is part of their identity, but not in the same way that a scientist's identity, <laughs> it has science to it in a way that is more, I don't know, it's just, I'm kind of reflecting on it spontaneously in the moment, but there's a, it strikes me in my own observation that the people who tend to say things like trust the science, follow the science because science do tend to be liberal. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't strike me that when people are saying that, that they have actually engaged with the scientific literature. It's more (laughs) of, it's more like there's this, um, there's these kind of sound bites Mm -hmm. that emerge from scientific literature to some degree and that's what people are being are saying that we should just trust or we should just trust what a scientist is saying but science is so cognitively demanding it Mm -hmm. really takes time and serious effort and skills to understand the nuance of a study and the fine Mm -hmm. details that upon which its credibility can be judged and so just this notion itself of trusting science, it, it's funny because it almost strikes me as a bit of an oxymoron. And trust me, I, 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 I engage with science, but the word trust, I don't think necessarily applies. Mm. I think we can analyze science. I think we can accept scientific results that come from a good, well-designed study. But the trust thing you actually don't, in my opinion, you don't need trust. The, to me, there's some, there's a blind element in trust and you don't have to be blind about it. You can actually read the science, analyze the science, examine and investigate the science, but trust almost feels like just have faith in God. Yeah. It's like, that's the liberal version of faith in God is mm-hmm. trust in science. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. And it's actually related to this paper that I'm I'm writing right now with uh, Lee Jessam and some people on reviving Mertonian norms. So Merton is a sociology of science guy. And one of the principles is skepticism, organized skepticism, but skepticism of science. Like mm. you shouldn't trust mm. science. Right. You should be very, very skeptical of science and you should test it over and over again in a new context and someone else should test it. We shouldn't let just this one person be the authority on it. And we should know that this replicates. We know that it has real world applications before we accept it. Um, and even then, should someone come along and, you know, cast out on it, then we need to be constantly up for re- revising our views on the issue. And yeah, yeah, that's that that is interesting because, yeah, you, sh- you really shouldn't. trust. Science. And like, I think you should trust like the institution of science mm-hmm. in general, like Process. it's trying yes. to do and it does a pretty good job in a lot of ways. Some fields are better than others. I would say my field's one of the ones that's not doing a very good job. Um, um, But when it comes to an individual scientific finding, no, you shouldn't. You should say, huh, that's possible. Or, okay, I I believe that 10% and now I believe it 18% or whatever. Um, And update incrementally like that. And I mean, I I thought the, how the whole like, 
re, re, like all of the information they were sort of disseminating to the public surrounding COVID and how it spreads and what we should do to minimize the spread was really interesting because it was really like a public display of the sort of moving target of science and how much, mm. I mean, some of it was like trying to control the public understanding. So that was, that was another element of it, but parts of it were just, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. Like even the experts don't know. Mm -hmm. And so they're constantly updating and trying to get closer and closer and closer to, to a better understanding of the situation. And that's all of science. Right. Um, we rarely have final answers or like a few, like we're pretty sure gravity is true. Mm -hmm. And we're like pretty sure evolution is real. And that's like basically <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, that's maybe an exaggeration but no, it's true but yeah you, you you can't believe like you can't believe like an individual study or even an individual set of studies mm. um, yeah mm. so that mm. is that is interesting the trust y yeah and mistrust it's, science <laughs> it's kind of more this that captures the spirit of science more it's it's mm. meant to be met with skepticism and yeah. critical thinking and also not, we're not suggesting anyone should deny, that's not the right word either. We don't right. deny science. So it's, it's like, there's, you know, perhaps a spectrum where on one end, you literally accept everything from the scientific news that you hear. And on the other hand, you literally deny everything. And then somewhere we can calibrate to a healthy skepticism where we really, mm -hmm. and it partly takes, you know, the education necessary to understand how data are generated and how they can be analyzed. And again, it's cognitively demanding and it, it, it's not, it's not a uh, instinctual necessarily. Yeah. Um, hmm, interesting. And it's just like, it, it's just, I think, I think something that is not maybe communicated to people who aren't, you know, involved in the sort of scientific process is just like that experts are, they're never really, well, not never, but they're rarely like fully experts. And there is often somebody or a lot of people who completely disagrees with them and thinks they're a total hack. <laughs> so like, you know, my mom or, you know, somebody will tell me about like some podcast they listen to and some person's on there saying something. And I'm like, yeah, that's wrong. Yeah, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. Wrong, wrong, wrong. <laughs> and they're like, oh, really? Why would you? What? No, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no. And then I s explain my side. And of course, they might have good reasons for thinking what they do. And I, I think I have good reasons for thinking they're wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes, we're exposed to like one piece of information. And then we just assume that that has been universally accepted by all scientists they all know that this is true and often rarely honestly it's probably like that and right. you shouldn't believe anything i'm saying right now mm. could be all bullshit <laughs> mm. it's almost like it's almost like an outgroup homogeneity effect applied to scientists where you mm. think they're probably all in agreement with each other because they're all scientists yeah. but it's they're not not like that no they're not in agreement with each other <laughs> <laughs> all right well let me let me pivot a little bit to the question of um, belief in someone's free will mm -hmm. and therefore accountability and punishment, you know, what punishment they deserve. So talk to me about that that line of research. Yeah, so this is kind of like my second, I guess I have like two main areas of research and this would be my second one. Um, I've looked at how I've looked at free will beliefs, which I think people don't really know what they mean when they say they believe in free will. I think they basically mean that the person's responsible um, and how they sort of motivatedly believe in that construct when they want to hold other people accountable or when they want to punish them or blame them. So I've run so many studies on this at this point. Um, but basically, when I make people want to punish another person by having them read about something bad somebody else did, they'll say that that person had more free will and they'll even say that people generally have more free will. So it's sort of this broad view that humans are capable of moral responsibility um, that seems to be uh, sort of like enhanced in our minds when we want someone to be held responsible. And there are lots of similar effects. So dating back, I think all the way to the sixties at least where if, somebody engages in a behavior and it causes harm, 
they think that person's more responsible than if they engage in that exact same behavior and it doesn't cause harm. Or um, the uh, classic one from like experimental philosophy is it's called the Nob effect, where it's like this chairman of the board and he wants to start this program and either the program, the program is going to increase profits, but either it's going to have a side effect that it could harm the environment or it could help the environment. Um, and the chairman says, I don't care about that. I just want to make profits and the environment is helped or harmed. And people say that the chairman intentionally harmed the environment, but they did not intentionally help the environment. So when you look at all of these kinds of attributions people make to a person's behavior, how much freedom, how much control, how much, um, how causal were they? Um, the more the thing causes harm, the more responsible people view other people to be. Um, so it suggests that part of the reason we have these concepts of responsibility and intentionality and all of these things we care about, like, did you mean to do that bad thing? Um, they partially exist so that we can sort of justify holding other people morally responsible and therefore punishing them and treating them poorly <laughs> um, mm. in mm. response to their bad action. Uh, and this has become really complicated for people lately, I think, as we've come to understand like the genetic causes of people's behavior and other issues like mental health issues that kind of, they kind of mess with people's feelings of, um, like whether a person is really responsible for their behavior. Like if, if, if a brain tumor caused someone to do something that they otherwise never would do, that kind of makes us think that they're not responsible. Well, how is a brain tumor any different from your genes? You know, you don't, in neither case, do you have any control over it? Mm -hmm. um, and so people are, this is going to be interesting to see how, how this continues to play out into the future as we, um, really come to understand all the causes of human behavior and what we do with that mm -hmm. and how we like treat people when they commit crimes or mm -hmm. even just do shitty things, you know, that we would want to punish them for. Right. Right. Yeah. It's a fascinating topic to me. And um, do you notice that people are applying motivated free will beliefs to some groups more than others? Mm -hmm. um, not like on whole, but I had a study looking at this in the context of politics where they have like a sort of bias pattern of responding where if a Democrat does something bad, Republicans will attribute more free will than, um, so yeah, so it's mm. exactly the mirror image of each other. So if Republicans do something bad, Democrats say they're more responsible than if a Democrat does something bad. And if a Democrat does something bad, Republicans attribute more response or more free will and responsibility than if a Republican does something bad. So they're both like excusing their in-groups behavior by saying like they didn't have that much control over the situation and elevating the out-groups behavior and saying that they had more. So you could imagine this could apply across numerous context um, in terms of how we view like in-group and out-group behavior, we think, and, and, and then our ability to sort of attribute evil motives to that. <laughs> um, again, because it's an ambiguous situation, you can never know what's in someone's heart. You can't ever know if they really intended something. Um, so you can attribute bad motives to them when you want to and not when you don't want to. And it, I mean, you, you're awakening the timeless philosophical mystery of free will and determinism. <laughs> and I'm, I'd be curious to know, do you have a philosophical position? Do, are you a determinist? <laughs> um, I'm kind of weird in that I'm neither a determinist nor do I believe in free will. <laughs> and I'm also not a compatibilist. So mm -hmm. compatibilists are people uh -huh. who think that free will and determinism um, can coexist. Mm -hmm. um, but simultaneously, I kind of am a compatibilist when it comes to not having free will, but preserving responsibility. Okay. Because I don't think people are actually like morally responsible in any way humans would understand it. Like, I think people are, people's behaviors caused by it their genes, their environment, the interaction between the two and noise and randomness. And there's no free floating self that operates outside of those other causes. Um, but at the same time, 
I suspect like the narrative that people are responsible for their behavior and the outcomes they cause um, to other people might be an important part of regulating social behavior. And like, I, I think about this, especially outside of the context of the law, we have behaviors that are illegal and that will be, the state will punish you if you do them, if you steal someone else's whatever, if you break into their home, if you rob a bank, there are, um, the state will handle that and they'll punish you to try to deter people so people don't do that. But in the context of everyday, like interpersonal interactions, like cutting in line at the grocery store, <laughs> we don't want that to be illegal because that would be a huge waste of resources. The way we regulate that is because there's social judgment involved. And if you cut in line at the grocery store, someone might call you an asshole and people don't want to be called an asshole. Um, and so they don't cut in line at the grocery store, even though it would be better if they could cut in line, it would it'd save a few minutes. Um, so I think there's a whole world of like actions that people could engage in that would be harmful to other people um, that they don't engage in because of moral judgment. And I think that sort of rests on this idea of responsibility. So like, I don't really believe in some sort of like, I don't even know, like the, a, a real existence of responsibility per se, but I believe in sort of like the social existence of it mm -hmm. um, and its functionality. I suspect it evolved precisely to deter other people from doing bad things. Like it's um, like a moral reputation. Uh, the, it's sort of like the evolution of moral reputation. Mm -hmm. I care what people think about me and I don't want them to think bad things about me. So I'm going to treat them well. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. thank you for sharing. So that's a weird, that doesn't really fit any of the terms, yeah. I don't think. True. Yeah. Yeah. And what about you? Okay. Okay. So I, I like to speak of free will. So first of all, I'll say, I do see it as inseparable from moral responsibility. And I, I do think that sometimes people or often people contradict themselves mm -hmm. when they want their determinism and their responsibility too. Mm -hmm. Because if indeed your thoughts, feelings, actions, everything are determined by impersonal factors, there's no logical way you could be held morally accountable for them because you are not the source of them. So I think that is a contradiction to, to believe in determinism and responsibility, which I'm not saying is what you said, but I think some people think in that way. So mm -hmm. I, I do, I like to talk about free will in terms of degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. And that helps, I think, to frame like situations where there seems to be more impersonal factors that caused this person's behavior when you find out well, what's that, a personal versus an impersonal factor that's a good question right? <laughs> because that that's really like a personality is a personal factor but um, it's presumably caused by like genes and upbringing right right largely genes really fair totally fair yeah and and that's really that is at the heart of it and i would so it the heart of it is like whether you believe there is a person in there, an agent acting and actually influencing anything. And I actually think that there is, but I don't think there's a lot of accurate like depictions of it. And I think- the But what word, is an agent? Like, I believe that humans' thoughts contribute to their behavior, which mm -hmm. influences the world. But I think their thoughts are also caused by their genes and their environments and their yeah. history. And right for me <laughs> yeah for me it comes down to the way i would put it i suppose is individualized consciousness and i feel like a lot of our philosophies around this end up relating to what your view is about whether consciousness is a passive witness mm -hmm. or an active participant mm -hmm. and my view is that consciousness as mysterious as it is in terms of where it comes from i think that is the source of of our active participation in life and that means that i believe that i think consciousness can generate 
impulses or that can actually generate something that influences actions. I completely agree with you. I think consciousness is causal, but I think consciousness is caused by genes and environments. <laughs> fair, fair. So you can chase it. I don't think it comes from that. Where do you think consciousness comes from, if not from a combination of genes and environments? My view is that conscious okay this this is not necessarily popular especially among scientists but i i embrace the analogy of the radio and the station when it comes to the brain and consciousness i would bet that the brain doesn't generate consciousness as much as it attracts and channels consciousness and shapes consciousness and makes certain forms and expressions of consciousness possible and some impossible. And now that brain, of course, is built based on genetic coding. And so how can we say that if the instrument is restricting consciousness, how, like, where's the freedom in that? But I, I would say still, so like the radio station analogy, just to finish that is, the radio channels a station and if a radio breaks that doesn't actually have anything to do with whether the station still exists and so i think the brain is like the radio here and the station is like consciousness but and then does the course, station come from where does the station come from if i <laughs> if, you, if i'm pinned down which i appreciate this very much if, if, if you're pinning me down <laughs> and say i think con consciousness is ever present and I don't necessarily have a religious view of that, but I actually think consciousness is, um, I suppose you could say timeless. When and does it start in a human life? That's, that's, that's a tough question, but I do think it has to do with brain development. And at some point the brain is developed enough to be able to channel consciousness. Mm -hmm. When that is exactly is, I, I don't know. You should write an article called You Can't Have Your Determinism and Responsibility Too. All right. I'll take you up on that. <laughs> that would be Clark weird. tells you you should write an article. <laughs> write an article. I you like that. I, 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 maybe I will. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and even aside from the source of free will and whether there is a valid basis for free will, and I'll just, let me say just two more things. I know that was like a lot, a lot of spurts of thoughts, but it's funny to think about how one of the arguments I think for consciousness being causal, which I know you said you agreed with, is that we talk about consciousness so much. And if, if consciousness is not the cause of our talking about it, then that would be a crazy coincidence. So that's just <laughs> one thought. But aside from the potentially valid basis of free will. I think we can think in terms of degrees of freedom. I think that the difference between the compulsion of a heroin addict to reach for her pipe is very different on the level of volition than a person who doesn't have an addiction choosing what they'd like to eat that, that morning. So I think it's useful to talk about degrees of freedom and I think it mirrors degrees of responsibility. And I think mm -hmm. that people can probably relate to where if you uh, hear a story of an abuser and what an abuser did and how um, just morally repugnant that is, your feelings about that abuser would change if you're able to identify factors in their past that begin mm -hmm. to explain it and begin to give you a sense that they weren't as free they didn't just decide to do that as freely as some people decide to do other things. And if you, the more factors you can identify that explain this person's behavior, the less responsible you begin to think of them. But how we judge what, like the, the, the degrees of freedom and therefore responsibility is difficult. I, I recently wrote a paper called um what is it called? The, the blame efficiency hypothesis. And I think the, the characteristics that people believe are important for responsibility might be those that track responsiveness to blame. So like a heroin addict 
blaming them actually wouldn't be particularly useful because the impulse to use heroin is so strong they could give a shit what you think about them right um and similarly like we don't hold babies morally responsible babies don't care what you think we don't hold animals morally responsible animals don't care what you think and this exists in varying degrees in humans as well and i think the more people would react to your moral judgment the more you think their mental state warrants moral judgment and responsibility is a hypothesis mm. could be wrong <laughs> so let me make let me see if i understand you is it so the more you think someone has the capacity to blame you the more you think they can be blamed Mm -mm. Okay. The more you think that blaming them will change their behavior, yeah. the more you think they deserve blame. I so see. the kinds of things that we believe are relevant for moral responsibility, whether someone intended something, let's take, for example, it makes more sense to say someone's responsible when they intended it, because blaming people for unintended things, trying to punish the intentions they never even had in the first place wouldn't really do much. Um, or similarly, blaming people when they cause something to happen. Well, if they didn't cause it to happen, you can't have, you can't like punish them to not causing the thing to happen again because they didn't cause the thing in the first place. Um, and cognitive sophistication, like people who have very low cognitive sophistication generally wouldn't have as complex of like a, a like sort of like a social concern system where they really care deeply about what other people think about them. And so, blaming them doesn't really do anything. Um, and so I'm, I'm suggesting the possibility that all of these features that we deem logically relevant to the deservingness of responsibility or blame, moral blame, um, probably actually track those, this is from like an evolutionary perspective, probably actually track those that indicate this person is malleable by my judgment. And if I hold them responsible and I blame them, they are less likely to do that in the future and other people like them are less likely to do that in the future. Interesting. Yeah, that makes sense. It could be wrong. <laughs> it's a hypothesis. but It's, it's a hypothesis. Compelling. It's compelling. <laughs> the, the emphasis that, you're, that you've said about like intentions and how intentions matter, that is, that is something that I think gets minimized in the philosophical position of determinism is the difference between voluntary and involuntary action. And I think determinists, they, they know that this is a critique. And so they emphasize, no, there really is a difference between voluntary and involuntary actions, but they're pinned down and have to say, they ultimately would say that every voluntary and so-called intentional act is ultimately involuntary. It's ultimately mm -hmm caused by something beyond your control. Mm -hmm. And I think that we're, that, that in the importance of intention needs to be preserved. Mm -hmm. Like I was having this conversation with a friend and we were trading off using my VR headset to box, right? This boxing game. Mm -hmm. The difference between me choosing to punch my friend in the face versus, <laughs> versus me accidentally punching him while I'm VR boxing matters that difference really matters and the mat what matters is that in one i intended to and one i did not intend to and i just i've had like the, kind of bringing it back to politics a little bit i noticed that there's a, a tendency among thinking in liberals that your intention actually doesn't really matter all that re really matters is the harm done and that's that's interesting to think about and I wonder if you've kind of encountered this or, or what your thoughts are on this view that all that really matters is what the outcome of your actions mm -hmm. are, not what you meant them to be. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? First, I'll say, I think that compatibilists, I've argued this in a paper called Forget the Folk, that compatibilism essentially emerged among philosophers who've come to dis accept determinism, but just still wanted to preserve responsibility. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like a really motivated belief, like, well, we think this is true, but people are responsible anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, regarding your point, yeah, no, that is, that is a sort of theme 
I wonder how much of that is sort of like an intellectual position versus like do liberals like a normal everyday average liberal think that because it's just um, I just don't think it's a it's sort of kind of what I was talking about before. It's sort of like a counterproductive way to judge other people's behavior because people it's really hard for people to not cause something they never meant to cause in the first place Mm -hmm. and so it feels unfair which can actually just upset it can just anger people (laughs) um and it's also going to be ineffective because people never know when they're stepping into something and it creates a sort of like like an environment where everyone's sort of walking on eggshells. I'm doing this study where I'm interviewing um, a bunch of professors about like taboo topics mm. and something that quite a few people express is they're like afraid of their students mm. because they're afraid they might say some say something in the wrong way or that they might say something will be interpreted in the wrong way or that like, you know, like something will be taken out of context and a soundbite on their, the Zoom video or something. Um, I think because of this idea that you could potentially be punished and in fact severely punished for offending someone when you did not mean to at all. In fact, you were trying to be a good teacher and like impart wisdom on the student and help them. um, But you said something in the wrong way and it was taken the wrong way. Um, And it just makes people scared of having like open conversations, which I think is a very high price to pay. Um, so I, I don't know how widespread that, that belief is that we really should be judging people based on, I mean, I think you have to do that a little bit, you know, that's why we have like the concept of negligence. Mm. If you really cause harm, and even if you didn't mean to, if you did something irresponsible, maybe we should think about that. But should that be just as big of a deal as if you meant to do it? Mm. No, <laughs> probably not. Um, and I hope that that argument doesn't gain too much traction and become yeah. a norm. And it's a good point that I, I don't mean to do everything we've been talking about and just kind of create caricatures of, you know. Yeah, <laughs> right. I don't mean to do that at all because you're right. And that's not that common, but I've definitely confronted it. And yeah, what a, what yeah. a fascinating thing that you're finding out from the professors that you're interviewing. And I am a professor myself and I will say that I teach at community colleges, which is like a real sweet spot in Mm -hmm. higher education. I I really love it so much because of the diversity of the student body, which is greater in community Mm -hmm. colleges than it is for universities. And that diversity kind of lends itself to a balancing out of Mm -hmm. political orientations and of levels of sensitivity and how easily offended people are and how likely they are to misconstrue something you're saying and et cetera. So yeah. I don't personally find that all that much yet, yeah. but it's, it's, I've heard many people talk about it. Many professors talk about it. And it's interesting that you're systematically interviewing them about it. It's kind of like the politically heterogeneous neighborhood, you know, like mm-hmm. they're around you. And so you just adjust and you have to be like tolerant of different perspectives. But when everyone's all the same and you all get angry about all of the same things, you just kind of incentivize each other to escalate problems. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I could imagine being a community college, given that everyone knows not everyone thinks exactly like they do, might mm-hmm. make people more tolerant in mm-hmm. general. Good point. Yeah, Because they're not going to be like, I have a whole band of people yeah. on my side. Right. <laughs> I will take you down. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's I think you nailed it. That's I think that's exactly what changes the culture of the classroom is that factor right there. It doesn't feel like everyone else is going to completely agree with you and get behind you. Yeah, that must be nice. Mm, it is. Yes. Yeah. <sighs> well, we've been talking for about oh, almost an hour yeah. and a half. Yeah, so... <laughs> So this has been fantastic. And who knows, maybe it can be part one of multiple conversations we have. This has been very intriguing for me. Thank you. This was fun. Yeah, I had a nice time too. Wonderful. Well, people should, you know, track your work. You have a great website. What's the URL for your website? I think it's (laughs) CoreyJClark.com. I recommend people check it out. And you've lit, you know, your CV is on there so you can see all the studies and that are in publication or have been published by Dr. Clark. And it's, it's a long list. And, and I, I think you have so much t- 
time ahead of you. And so it's amazing just what you're doing with your career already. I'm inspired. Thank you. Hopefully I can keep it up. <laughs> yeah. Yep. All right. Well, well, thank you to the listeners and the watchers. I always yes, thank you all. At the end. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> isn't it wonderful? Like people who are listening to the whole conversation is just exactly who this is podcast is really for the people who want to engage on this level. So thank you to those of you who have watched it. I'm glad it was interesting enough to watch the whole thing. And yeah, Dr. Clark, I hope you have a wonderful day and let's stay connected. Thank you. You too. Sounds good. All right. If you like this video and you want to see more, please subscribe.